welcome to the 905er podcast. And today we're leading off our series of interviews with 905 region candidates uh, to explore the issues and platform promises that matter in our region. Before election day, we'll be interviewing a representative from the three leading parties in Ontario. Uh, and we won't be asking about whatever is dominating Twitter today. We'll be looking at what the parties say they can do for us and how credible those promises are. So we're kicking off our series with the NDP and their candidate in Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas, who is running to uh, take a seat away from the Liberals. Roberto Enriquez is a lawyer who came to Hamilton as a student and says he fell in love with the city. He's now running as the NDP candidate in Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas, a riding held since 2015 by Philomena Tassi. In Enriquez's legal work, he represents and fights for everyday Hamiltonians, uh, along with trade unions. So welcome to the podcast, uh, Roberto. Delighted to have you on. Um, and as I said, we're, we're, we're going to focus uh, as much as possible on kind of, you know, what what uh, your party platform is, is suggesting. Um, and there's a few areas that we think are, are really important in the 905. Um, and uh, I think perhaps none is more uh relevant to to people in our region that than the uh, housing affordability uh, crisis so perhaps you could kick us off by by giving us an outline of uh of what the ndp is uh, suggesting they can do to to counter the the affordability crunch that we're all seeing yeah no uh, thank you first of all for having me um i think that is a fantastic question um i'm i'm in the age group um you know, the 30 to 35 age group won't give you my exact age so that anyone you know, takes issue with my youth. But uh, I'm in that relatively young age group um, where I'm seeing a lot of my own friends struggle with uh, with purchasing a home. And I'm in the position, um, as you mentioned, I'm a lawyer. So I, you know, we, we are fairly, um, fairly well off. We're in a good position. Um, but nonetheless, um, had had my family not chosen to purchase a home a couple of years earlier, um, I think we, I think we definitely would have um, faced challenges. Um, I don't know that we'd be able to get into the market the way that things are right now, um, and the, the prices continue to increase. And I think that the the NDP certainly appreciates that those are challenges. Um, as as a society, we have to get to the point where we, you know, we ask ourselves: Are we are we abandoning that dream where um, everyone can own a home? Um, are we, are we moving to something where? It's strictly a question of, of accommodation, whether it's renting or some other form. Um, but I think what the NDP is trying to do is is put together a plan that um, that makes housing like an ownership, an option for folks. Um, so um, of of the many issues that are out there, um, I, I think it's commonly known that um, foreign investors are you know have have a large role in the Canadian um, housing market. Um, both, both for you know, dirty money laundering. Um, you know, the, the term snow washing is, as we've we've heard coined in the in the global market with respect to Canadian housing, but also you know, with respect to people who have legitimate interests and are you know potentially purchasing homes for families or, or for investment pieces. Um, but one of the things that I think is is important to note there is that the NDP wants to bring in a twenty percent twenty percent foreign buyers tax for all individuals who are uh, who, who are purchasing but are from outside of the country um, and I think that 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 is at least one step whereas well you know that may not um, stop or bring the prices down it should alleviate some of those upward stressors that we're seeing on on housing prices so um, so that 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 is a key um, motivator and I, and I think one thing that's interesting to point there is that the federal government well the liberals at least have you know, have, have noticed that this is an issue and, and have identified um, that uh, foreign buyers uh, create some of those upward stresses. And they've, they've introduced a plan, I believe, in the last, um, I, you know, where does the time go right now? In the last few days at some points, but uh, to uh, put in a two-year ban, I believe, on, on foreign buyers um, for, for housing here in Canada. Um, that that is insufficient, right? Like that, that'll be a two year stop um, and it'll stop prices from going up um, from, from that outward stressor for a period of two years, but there won't be anything after that. Whereas the NDP is proposing an ongoing 20% tax. Um, another thing that I think is important um, is uh, as, as we all know in, in 2015, I believe it was 2015, but there were the, um, there were the pieces introduced to the, um, um, 
the, the stress test, um, sorry, I was at a loss there, but the stress test for, uh, for new buyers. Um, and that was designed to keep the market from, from falling out from under so that, you know, people wouldn't go under in the sense that they couldn't maintain their mortgage prices, default on payments. That, that was, that was the idea there. Um, but it, as, as part of that, um, I, th- I think we'll all recall that, um, the, the amortization periods were, were reduced um, for uh, for a large number of folks, so it came down from from what it used to be, and now now we're at a maximum of twenty five years. One of the other things that the NDP wants to do is um, you know increase that again, bring it back up to thirty years, um, so that what you can see is you know with with a five year increase that that's another sixty months of payments, which allows individuals to have their you know their their prices reduced. Um, when we went back to the the question about um oh sorry I, 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 it looks like i see a question there i well i yeah i was i was want to just jump in um because we we had on uh last week uh mike moffat to actually talk about this and uh not so much to go into the the platforms as we said but we just kind of want to get a sense of how big a scope of this this issue is um the the one thing that we kind of came away from that discussion with is it's not just a federal issue. Um, and, and there's one thing that we were talking about was, you know, zone, you know, the things like zoning issues with the municipalities, as well as provincial, like provincial jurisdiction on, um, on, uh, on giving municipalities the, the powers to kind of control their own development, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the federal government could provide the funds to fuel that, that, the, the necessary growth. Um, the one thing I've, I haven't heard from any party, the NDP, Liberal, or the Conservatives, is that how you would work with the, pro- the provinces and the municipalities to really ch- kind of get a, an, an actual national strategy. Uh, I mean, we're talking about a lot of money being put into the uh, into the program from all, all three parties. Are, they're saying they're going to spend X amount of dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just wondering, like, what, what, how, how, how do you see how do you see the federal government really fitting in? Are, is this going to be a panacea? You solved all the problem, or is this, you know, down the road you're putting money into it, but it, it gets stymied because the Ontario or Alberta or Quebec government said, "Well, no, we don't want to do it this way. We want to do it our way." Um, how, how do you how do you see the federal government's role in, in this uh, situation? I I think that's a fantastic question, um, uh, and I, I ultimately as, as you know, as you've said, there there is going to be a question of jurisdiction that comes up um, because uh, questions will arise in terms of um, uh, local housing strategies or, or complying with um, local or provincial um, mandates with respect to growth over over a certain period of time in Ontario. I know there's there's a specific um, you know growth plan for the for the province. So I, I think that they're you know they're obviously going to have to uh, there's obviously going to have to be some dialogue. But on the specific strategy, um, I certainly think that that's um, something that I would I myself would would have to go back and, and circle back with uh, on the party uh, and with the party on that. Um, and I'm definitely happy to uh, to follow up on that specific question in terms of the strategies that would be involved in dialoguing with the province, um, which would then you know download to the municipalities. So. Um, you know, if, if you'll permit me that, I, I think that there is there is a dis- discussion to be had on that point. Um, I'm just not equipped to answer that at the moment, and I'd be I'd be happy to circle back through you know through our manager to to respond to that piece. Well, uh, we'll, we'll we'll do that after the episode. Um, now we've talked about um, home buying, which is obviously a huge component, but but in a uh, city like Hamilton in particular, and, and across the nation. Um, Rental, um, the, the crisis faced by renters is, is in many ways ju- just as um, difficult and, and has been around almost longer. Uh, now, I do I notice in your platform that there's mention of, of co-ops and, and social non-profit housing, um, and and that's actually a, an issue somewhat close to my own heart. Um, what tell us what the NDP is suggesting uh, they will do to to break through this the the, the the really chronic shortage in, in rental accommodation and the lack of rental accommodation being built in uh, in well particularly in the 905 yeah um, so I mean in in Hamilton I believe um, the statistics are that there are about five thousand um, five thousand families on the waiting list if I'm not mistaken for city housing um, as, as uh, you know something that's ongoing um, so the waiting lists are are uh, significantly long. Um, one of the things that that the NDP has put into their platform is, uh, you know, they, they they are interested in introducing a five hundred thousand uh, affordable home uh, promise over the course of ten years. Um, 
then this this potentially you know touches on on Joel's earlier question about the the, nego- the negotiations and dealings with the provinces and the municipalities, um, but uh, the commitment is there to have um, that funding to uh, to to build uh, a greater number of homes to make it um, more you know more accessible for folks who are renting. And and I know you did deviate from from the point on on buying, but I, th- I think the other piece, because you mentioned um, cooperatives, um, I, not quite the same, but on the buying front, um, the NDP does want to allow for um, more opportunities for individuals to enter into co-ownership models um, with other folks where you would have, um, you know, potentially the Canadian Housing and Mortgage Corporation, so the CMHC, covering um, these types of arrangements um, that you know, even in door knocking with individuals, I've seen some people mention to me, you know, they're not spouses, they're not in a civil union, um, but they're, they're a couple of colleagues or friends who've entered into the market together. Um, but I think by by providing um, those opportunities and creating a system that, that helps those individuals move into these types of ownership models, um, you know, that co-ownership will, will also be a piece that will assist more people to get into the market, especially if it's, if it's you know, sponsored or perhaps not sponsored, but at least supported or fostered by, um, by a federal government. So we, 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 I, I can tell you right now that Joel and Joel and I could both talk about housing for the rest of the day, but we should probably <laughs> move on to, uh, one of the other subjects, uh, although it, it's such an important one, uh, it almost, it certainly deserves all the attention, but, um, when we start, started the podcast, one of the one of the subjects we really wanted to highlight was um, First Nations and Indigenous issues in our region. As you know, even within a region that is that is considered to be urban, where we don't necessarily always think that Indigenous issues are, are a central subject, and mm-hmm. and almost by coincidence, the whole issue of Indigenous reconciliation has kind of exploded onto the scene in the years since we've been been going. Um, so it's good to see that all the platforms have, you know, uh, mention of reconciliation, uh, with our first nations and indigenous people, but, um, in practical terms, we could say to all parties, well, we've heard this before, um, Mm -hmm. what's going to be different this time. So, well, let's start off again with, with you giving an outline of what the, uh, NDP, is suggesting uh, that they'll do, and then we can dive into uh, the extent to which that will that would be a fundamental change of, of direction with regard to how we relate with the First Nations. Yeah, um, and as as you've mentioned, if you've seen the platform, there there is um, there's actually a full section on this that that's cons- that's quite long as compared to some of the other sections. Um, so I think that what you've seen is that there is a you know there there is a dedication from the NDP to to addressing it, um, as much of these issues as as can possibly be addressed. Um, I think the NDP um, recognizes that there have been challenges um, for uh, for for members of of the indigenous population in Canada. Um, I think regardless of of what you look at, um, whether it's um, you know the housing crisis um, in in northern communities, um, or the um, the level of mold and, and, and toxic substances in in, in northern communities, um, whether it's the, the drinking water um, crisis in in a number of different communities. I believe uh, we were at 160 drinking water advisories. I think we're still at about 80 or 90, if I'm not mistaken, with with some that are in flux but haven't quite been. Um, been fixed, um, and and now of course uh, you know the uh, the bodies that are being found at these residential schools. Um, I think if we look at what um, you know the the, the truth and reconciliation um, you know reports and 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 the calls to action stated, it, it's it's a very like it's a holistic approach. Whether we're looking at legal issues, whether we're looking at education, um, <clears throat> whether you know we're we're looking at specific housing strategies, um, it is a holistic approach that's being proposed in those um, calls to action. And I think the the fact that we see all of these specific pieces um, being put into the platform um, reflects an understanding that that this is you know it's it's more than one specific targeted issue. It's 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 a sw- 
switch that needs to be taken and that needs to be flicked in order to recognize that we have a long way to go on all fronts. Um, so in, in terms of the specific pieces, like I said, there, there's definitely a lot that can be discussed similar to that to the housing piece. But, you know, one of the first things, um, you know, we can talk about the, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, right? Um, the, the federal government, as it stands now, has, has in the past said, um, hey, great, this, this is a thing that's awesome. Um, uh, we, we appreciate it, um, but we recognize that it's non-binding. But it's cool. We want to we wanna live up to the spirit of, of what it speaks to. Um, I think that um, the NDP government actually you know, wants to incorporate that and make that a formal binding document that we would um, we would live under and and we would carry on under, um, which would um, you know speak to different um, uh, uh, obligations with respect to um, indigenous communities. So rather than the, the concept of consultation, which has been something that's developed through the legal jurisprudence, um, you know the NDP has spoken about having free, prior, and informed consent. So more meaningful negotiations with the indigenous communities when it comes to questions of resource extraction um, or or simply use of lands for for a, a purpose that uh, that's been determined by the state. Um, so uh, sorry, Joel. I, well. I, I- yeah, I, 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 you brought up a good point about you know the the autonomy of First Nations and their in respecting treaty rights uh, and what have you. And I think that's in the past uh, mandate of the Liberal government. We saw we you know with them trying to um, I'm thinking about the the Wet'suwet'en people on the west coast of, of Canada. Uh, they're trying trying to figure out the the pipe Trans Mountain pipeline and whatnot, and that led to a uh, you know. A, a, a long series of protests across the country. You know, how, how does the NDP reconcile that with trying to build national infrastructure? Not, I'm not just talking pipelines. Uh, I'm talking, you know, roads, uh, high, you know, hydro dams for, for uh, power generation, uh, you know, any, any big national infrastructure project. If you know, are we like if we're talking about re, re reestablishing that that connection with First Nations that we give them the autonomy of their land that they that mm-hmm. they're supposed to have? Um, are, are, is the NDP willing to deal with the the backlash of maybe uh, the, a certain First Nations community says no, we we don't want to sell the land or we don't want to partner with the government to do X project? You know, how 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 how, how willing are you willing to go to to kind of establish this new new relationship? Right, and and I think that 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 what you hit on is the um, you know it's, is the practical challenges of these types of uh, negotiations, um, but um, but but as a lawyer, one of the things that I can tell you is um, you know when when you're negotiating with with other parties in a in a dialogue that is you know that that is embodies this concept of free and informed consent you know I, I, I can't ram a specific contract down an opposing party um, we we need to uh, you know we need to negotiate on, on the proper terms and if it's not acceptable it's something that's not going to be acceptable um, and I think that ultimately um, when these discussions start to happen um, you know it, it'll be different because in the past it has been um, sometimes it's been a very superficial concept of, of um, of uh, consultation, um, if, if there's no agreements, there's there's the opportunity to simply move on and say, well, we tried, and, and that's the end of the story. But once we start engaging in these dialogues and and treating them, uh, treating the indigenous populations and communities as as people with the, their own autonomy and their rights over over um, the, their specific you know territories, I think that they're um, you know, I, th- I think that that will create a new opportunity to, uh, to to move forward on 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 specific issues that are being tackled, um, because we'll be treating um, these these communities as as their own uh, party with their own standing. Um, now, I can't speak to what what will happen when when ultimately those challenges arise, but I do believe that um, presented with this new framework, um, there will be an opportunity to uh, to engage fully, and, and you know, maybe without specifically talking about a specific example, um, you know, maybe maybe there's um, you know, routes or logistics that can be worked out that that are carved out for specific groups that that don't want to be part of a um, you know a specific infrastructure project. But I think if you're committed to this, then then as a government, you should be committed to uh, to altering your plans to uh, to recognize you know as as you said the autonomy of these other these groups. Um, I I wanted to move on uh, just from uh, uh, first issue because there are lots of issues to talk about. It's an election, of course. Um, the one thing. Uh, that I've I've kind of noticed the party we're starting to get into it finally in the election in terms of the national dialogue, but the COVID nineteen 
recovery post COVID-19, what Canada is going to look like. Um, this is something we f- I think we're finally starting to get into the dialogue with on the national conversation. Um, there's something that I, I'm looking at your, your platform right now. And there's something I did. I want to talk about, cause this is kind of something that's near and dear to my heart. Cause I've been going through issues, uh, relating to it. It's high speed internet mm-hmm. and high speed, uh, you know, broadband options for Canadians, because we've seen with COVID-19 in the last two years, people have been working from home. This has become, mm-hmm. you know, the idea that we're going to be doing more of our, our, our jobs from uh, the living room, you know, from, from a home office. And we need kind of a, a reliable infrastructure that will enable that. Um, and there was a recent story in the CBC that the majority of Canadians are not getting the, the high speed service that they are supposedly paying for from the, the telecom giants in this country. And I'm wondering if you could maybe speak a bit to how the NDP is going to address it. Cause I'm seeing there's a pretty big, section in your uh, in the platform just on that uh that uh that concept yeah um and i think this may be one of those um that i i, I want to circle back with you on because there is a big section and i believe um, part of the ndp's commitment is to have high speed internet available um and affordable for all individuals if i'm not mistaken within a period of five years um the specific um logistics for that is is something that um i I, again as as with the earlier question something that i would need to circle back on on how it is that we you know we want to achieve that because i don't think those specifics are spoken to um but i recognize in fact i think i was i was having this discussion with myself today but um but i you know that's certainly something that i if we can put it down on the list i'm happy to circle back I guess a bit of a bit more of a higher level approach to it, though. You know how how do you feel the importance of this being sorted out post COVID nineteen? Because you know that nobody's really talking about it, but I think to the majority of Canadians, they say, I mean, if you go on any community forum online, you're going to hear my internet dropped. You know, so mm-hmm. so my service is spotty. I don't get. You know, I can't download. I can't. My Zoom call dropped because my internet went on the fritz. Um, and even we've lost recordings uh, because of internet dropping here. And I'm just, you know, not in terms of specifics, but how, how do you uh, how do you see this as an importance for uh, the 905 region? Yeah, no. Uh, so, so I definitely, um, and actually, thank you for for bringing it back to the 905 um, because I think um, I, I I recognize that that it is something that is critically important, as as mentioned. Um, in in my day to day life, I I practice as a lawyer, and that that involves you know participating in in hearings, litigation, um, you know, in the trial setting, and oftentimes um, I run into folks, and this doesn't this doesn't necessarily include the 905 right now, but just by way of example, you know, I run into folks representing people in Northern Ontario, um, and oftentimes, um, you know, we're participating in a hearing, everything's being done virtually, and an individual will say. Sorry, I've I've cut out, and um, uh, you know I I'll need to circle back in ten or fifteen minutes for you know until things are corrected. Um, I don't think that that is something that that is necessarily um, in that that doesn't exist. Let's say in in the nine hundred five, there are particular areas um, such as um, the the you know the local indigenous populations and, and and reserves where I think that we we see those spotty connections. And by way of example, when when we consider the legal process. Um, if at the end of the day, if, if, if we're in a proceeding and someone is, um, you know, the that face to face is is something that that is important to carry on in a proceeding to give somebody the opportunity um, to get their fair their fair shot um, in in the judicial process, um, then by not having that available, um, you know, you are you are it's essentially a detriment to that individual and their access to justice. Take that concept within justice and extend that to uh, to other uh, specific um, situations like healthcare, and it's the same type of question that arises because if you are, are you know can't go see a doctor because doctors aren't seeing people in person um, in part because of the COVID concerns, um, but if if that leaves you with the opportunity to have a video conference similar to to you know what what we're doing or what we're doing with clients, um, then. Uh, if you don't have the proper connection, that that again serves as a detriment to your own health. So I think that um, 
take this and, and put it where, it, where wherever it fits. Um, uh, it, it, it is a, of critical importance. People need access to, to basic services, which in, in a lot of ways are being offered now online and remotely. And if, if those connections aren't up to snuff, um, then, then those people are, you know, are, are facing the consequences for not having those, those proper connections. So I very much appreciate um, that, that it's, a, it's a need, um, especially for um, northern and, and outer communities of, of core central you know, urban areas. Um, and I think that the NDP recognizes that, which is why um, I, I had misspoke before, but the commitment is four years, I believe, for, uh, um, for um, internet uh, you know, broadband services. Yep. So... Um, uh, let's you know we've got a, about a few minutes left let's just expand out a little bit from that in that it seems to well, i think everybody probably recognizes that that covid has been a game changer in many ways and that um well certainly if i can speak about my own feelings and i'm pretty sure joe shows them shares them we're not going back to life entirely as normal and and in some ways that will be a good thing like telecommuting, working far more from home seems like, uh, like why wouldn't we want to embrace that um, in terms of reducing car traffic and on and on, on you know, so many knock-on effects. What do you think, um, and I'm really asking you to kind of blue sky here, are, are, are the big challenges for the next, say, 10 years that arise from that? And what, what do you think our next government, whatever it might be, um, will have to do to address those those uh, challenges. Yeah. So one, of, I think the biggest one that this will tie into um, is is ultimately the the environment. Um, as you've mentioned, um, we saw we've seen a significant slashing in emissions, at least initially. Um, I think I think things may be getting a little busier now. If you look at the highways driving along the 905, um, but at least initially there was certainly a significant drop in. Um, carbon emissions because people weren't driving, um, planes weren't flying as much. So we saw a significant cut in, um, in emissions for, for a number of different sectors as well. Of course, the petroleum industry um, had some difficulties where I believe petroleum um, was actually trading at, at negative dollars uh, for a certain point um, or, earlier on in 2020. But I think that that will ultimately become the biggest challenge, recognizing that we've given you know the globe this this bit of fresh air and and that people have now been turning to um climate change and global warming and and you know being receptive to it as an issue um i think the question is going to be how are we going to you know use this um this moment that is that that has um you know as as, as kind of an externality for what we've seen because of the covid dip um, how are we going to use this moment to continue that trend and, and to try to you know curb those emissions so to me that seems like it is it is the most significant issue um uh, based on you know some some of the consequences that we've seen as a result of covid um and if you'd allow me to speak to that, I mean, I, I think that um, I think that the NDP has made commitments here on on a number of different points. I mean, they um, what we've seen thus far with the government that is in power um, is uh, a a lack of serious commitment to the the climate. To, to climate change um, and, and to controlling our, our increasing emissions. Um, there is there's a promise in 2015 to essentially um, meet uh, you know all of the targets that were required. Um, but so what, what essentially amounted to by 2030, we wanted a cut of our emissions, I believe 30% of 2005 by 2030. Um, but we didn't really see anything until earlier this year when the um, Canadian Net Zero Accountability Act, and then I may be misquoting the name, but when that was passed in, um, into legislation. Um, but ultimately, if, if you review that, um, there, there are a lot of places where the government is betting from, or benefiting from uh, changes in accounting based on you know, land use changes and, and the use of, of specific um, sections of land that can be accounted as, as uh, carbon sinks. So things that take away um, you know, emissions from, from our overall tally. Um, but there wasn't really a lot of new action until this very last moment. And I think what the NDP is trying to do um, is they're trying to put in a plan in place which um, will allow us to exceed these targets um, that, that have been set uh, both for 2030 and 2050. Um, they are wanting to pivot on you know, their, their, their million jobs plan. Um, there, there's an investment that, that we want to see in, um, in renewable energy. Um, 
compare and contrast with other parties that have told us that um, you know we're we're looking at um, balancing the economy with the environment at the same time we're buying a four billion dollar pipeline. Um, you know there there is there is another way, and I think what what the NDP wants to do is again invest in those jobs now so that we can start transitioning individuals to uh, to the jobs that will allow us to move into uh, the renewable sector um, and will allow us to keep on on the trend that we started seeing at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Okay, so there was actually a uh, report in the news today. I think it was from the Fraser Institute. Uh, and, um, I'm sorry, I don't have that. I'm not 100% sure about that. If I'm wrong, I will correct it in our show notes. Um, and it was kind of it, it was it was from uh, I believe an environmentalist uh, and the kind of his review of the NDP commitments was that you know well this is great and that you've made really tough commitments but but actually they're so tough that they're completely unrealistic and it would have a really drastic effect on, on the economy so he kind of gave you a, a more negative score than he actually gave to the conservatives. Now, how 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 do you argue back against the the points that he raised? That like you know you can't just set targets and say okay we're going to be we're going to be net zero carbon or net zero emissions by twenty thirty, if that at the same time would would be untenable for uh, uh, for business. Mm-hmm. So I, I obviously not having read the report, I, I can't specifically uh, comment to that. But even even if we move away from um, you know from from the commitments, which are are simply the commitments and, and potentially exceeding the commitments from the Paris Accord, I think there are other pieces in there that that speak to the the NDP's commitment to um, weaning us off of the fossil fuel industry, um, specifically you know the oil sands, which are the um, you know, a significant source of polluter in in, in emissions in in, in Canada. Um, by way of example, um, I, I believe the the petroleum industry received eighteen billion or so in uh, in subsidies o- over the course of, of the pandemic in the last couple of years. Um, Imperial Oil, I believe, I believe, had received a hundred million um, or so from the uh, wage subsidy and and still paid a you know three hundred uh, million or so in in dividends. Um, so I think uh, one of the commitments specifically is that the NDP wants to start uh, you know eliminate the subsidies to a lot of these um, petroleum producers. So there there are some some elements um, you know th- that will need to be filled in as as the process continues. But I think that there are some core elements as well that are in the platform. Um, that are uh, that would you know cause an immediate impact on what we've seen at, um, from the emissions in terms of the big producers. So um, again, can't specifically comment on on the report that I haven't read, but I, I would say that there are tangible pieces in here that um, that will Im- immediately bear results and bear fruit. It, well, I think uh, we, as I, as we say so often on the show, we could go on for for uh, <laughs> another another hour easily. We have to take pity on our listeners who who uh, uh, may not uh, uh, have as much time as we do, or as uh, you know, need to get to the point more quickly than we do. Uh, so we really appreciate uh, you joining us today, Roberto. We wish you all the best with, uh, with your campaign, and uh, thanks so much for for. Uh, really going through the platform and and uh and not talking about the other guys too much uh i for myself i really enjoy that so thanks so much for joining us today uh, yeah i definitely appreciate you having me um and um as, as i said if, if there are other questions that that we want to circle back on uh, please feel free to reach out and we're happy to uh, to provide answers sure thank you very much <laughs> That's it for this episode of the 905er. Thank you for listening. As always, you can send us your feedback, thoughts, and concerns, or ideas for future episodes to our email, info at 905er.ca. We'd love to hear from you. You can help us keep the 905er going by financially supporting us through Patreon as well as PayPal. Visit us at 905er.ca and click on the support tab. As well, links are in the show notes for your convenience. Lastly, you can find us on social media. Search for the underscore 905er on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So long for now. See you next time.
you looking to make the most out of this life and optimize your personal wellness? Then check out the Natural Man Podcast. Join me, host Mike C., as we explore all areas of human wellness, physical, mental, and emotional. Learn strategies to optimize your own well-being and be in the driver's seat of your own health. Remember, your doctor works for you. Learn biohacks, neurohacks, ways to improve sleep, and ways to optimize your body and your mind. Check us out on Apple, Spotify, the Fountain app, and at naturalmanpodcast.com.